Good afternoon and welcome to Five Questions, Five Artists Representing Legacy with Mr. Wash. My name is Christine Y. Kim. I'm co-curator of Black American Portraits exhibition at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, covering 200 years of African-American portraiture with 140 works of art by 110 artists, including Mr. Wash's portrait of Kobe Bryant entitled Shattered Dreams from 2020. Today's program is in the second round of this public program series, Five Questions, Five Artists, and is the penultimate program. The final one will be with Kim Dakers on March 24th. I'd like to welcome Mr. Fulton Leroy Washington, AKA Mr. Wash to today's program and thank him for being part of LACMA's historic exhibition and family and for being part of this program today. So Mr. Wash, if you could please turn on your camera and your, um, and your mic. Um, Fulton Leroy Washington was born in Tallulah, Louisiana. He taught himself how to paint extraordinary portraits, still lives, animals, landscapes, figurative imagery while incarcerated um, in federal prison for nonviolent drug offenses. He taught dozens of fellow inmates how to paint and to draw. In masterful and detailed compositions, Washington captured the inmates' interior psychological vulnerabilities often in expressed in large tears running down their faces. Some portraits are adorned with miniature paintings within paintings that depict fears or anxieties and subjects shared with the artists. But I also wanna point out that many of these portraits are full of hope, full of optimism, full of narratives, full of loved ones. And we're gonna hear about some of those portraits today. So without further ado, um, we can start in on those questions. Welcome and thank you. How are you doing today? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And I want to thank you and your team and the audience out there for sharing their time with me today. Excellent. So let's pull up um, the, an image of Shattered Dreams. Of course, I'm in a virtual background. I wish we were in the show together. I know you're, from, you're in Palm Springs right now yes. working on your next project at the Palm Springs Museum of Art. And thank you for logging on, even as you're not in L.A. and, and working away. Um, this portrait actually you see an image of it also in my virtual background, Shattered Dreams, extraordinary image of Kobe Bryant that you painted just after his passing, included in Black American Portraits. Could you tell us a bit about your choice of medium and materials? Some of you may not know that um, in addition to um, oil on stretched canvas, that there's glow in the dark paint on this. Um, what was your choice of, of the materials? Were there any surprises that happened in the planning process or the final work um, and, the, and the symbolism in this portrait, which really, you know, for those of you who haven't seen this painting or haven't seen this exhibition, I really encourage you to come in because the, the size of the brushes, which, you know, the last time I was in your studio and you, you shared with me, I needed to put my glasses on to even see the brushes themselves, let alone look at the detail in this painting, because you really got to get up close to see how exquisite and, and, and detailed and, and photo real, hyper real this image is. So, yes, this, this specific piece, you know, with Kobe's death, it, it brought about emotional uh, change and feeling to me. I didn't know anything about Kobe or uh, basketball, never watched a game in my life. Um, but the impact that it was having on the world, you know, I decided to create this in oils, using oils on stretch canvas. I decided to go larger than my normal size of 1620 and to create a bigger image. This image is actually um, a 60 by uh, 48, so it's five feet by four. And there were many surprises that came in this painting. You know, one was that, you know, in doing the research is how prolific he was in, in his craft of basketball. You know, he, he put in a lot of time. And so becoming to understand the character, it helped me develop and start to feel him spiritually. And, I think one of the hardest things, like you say, was the, the very small, small detail, you know, the, the full portrait of a family portrait inside of his head that 
would actually fit on your fingernail. You know, the faces were really, really small. Uh, it was just surprising how many times I had to paint the faces over just to move an eye over a 32nd of an inch or so, because if you put it in the wrong spot or a nostril on the nose, that was the biggest surprise, yeah. noses. Little bitty noses of all the little babies was really like, they have so many together, you know, you normally do one at a time, but now you're doing the whole family, you're jumping around from nose to nose, ear to ear, trying to get that detail to be that person, you yeah. know? It's interesting. I'm going to paraphrase this, the second question based on your response, because, you know, it's almost as if, you know, one would think that you are this huge basketball fan, but you weren't, you almost did this for, for the people. For yes, the people who love Kobe Bryant, you know, that you saw this emotional outpouring from from all kinds of people in L.A. and around the world and that you wanted to to give something to, yeah. to, to the people and, and to the family depicted in in the this this kind of inside the interiority of, of his head. Yeah, it's, you know, in doing the research and, and learning about him and most people, when you talk to them, they just they they think about the loss to the basketball, to the industry, to, you know, to the team. But feeling him spiritually is the loss of his family. That's what's really in his head. It's not the basketball is his job, his career, but his family is his love. And I want to make sure that the people understood what's in his head. You know, the ball's coming out of his eyes, the tears. Okay, his career is over, but we changed many jobs and careers in our lifetime but we only have one family and that's the most important thing. I want to make sure that they all were included. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Third question is what is the responsibility of the artist when it comes to representing a significant figure and their legacy? The responsibility of the artist is when you paint a significant person is to do, do, do your research, you know, find out about who they really are not just the image that you see them in front of the camera, in front of the public, but to go into the background, try to find out, you know, what made them who they are to be that significant person. And so I think we, as an artist, we have a responsibility to, um, to, to research our subjects, whether they be people, animals, or whatever, to pay close attention to small details that things are not, uh, especially in portrait work, they're not perfect. The eyes are not the same. Kobe had a few scars, you know, through playing basketball. And as I went through volumes of pictures, I, I found little spots and things. I would put them in, you know. I thought they were significant enough um, to try to get as many details, like the little nip in his ear, you know, at the top. It's like, well, why do you put so much time in to put that little lump right there on his ear? Well, because that lump shows up in so many different pictures as part of his character. Um, people that's really close to him would know that lump. You know, his barber who would cut his hair, you know, he, he would notice that lump. And so that's, those people can look and say, oh no, he, he really captured the person. He found things that most people would just painted a human ear, but no, we have to paint Kobe's ear. Mm. Yeah. And these other details, maybe you can talk about the um, the details on on his jacket and other sort of details that you put into this painting and that research, yeah, and your choices there. And it all still comes back from research. You know, he played uh, he played and built a lot of his career in Los Angeles, so I put L.A. in. I carved it into his after I painted after I painted the picture. It wasn't part of the design when I first created. It. A lot of this is it, it evolves into a painting. You know, we start off with the subject matter, but then through the research, he's from L.A., let's put L.A. in. Well, why is he in L.A.? Staples Center. Let's put Staples Center inside of L.A. Um, how did he leave? What blows in the wind is passing? Helicopter crash. So we put that in, you know, because this is all part of history. It's not to give a significant PowerPoint to one thing or another, but it's to let the people in the viewer know that his life was full. You know, he, he came in, uh, basketball was his career. The symbol that's on his watch is the, the symbol for the team, the him and his daughter, the Mamba symbol. Um, and then the, the jumping back, just if you if people, if you notice that 
the splash that comes out of the water is actually a king's crown. Mm -hmm. I took a king's crown and converted it into a splash of water as he jumped up. He was the king. He was the top of his league. So he's shooting his, his famous three-point shot, but it's also dropping full net. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the small details. And the, the multiple cracks, his life is it, deteriorating. You know, history allows other things to come in and become more important and significant. And so uh, your, your moment of fame only lasts for so long. Pretty soon, in hundreds of years, there'll be something else that'll come up and overpower that. So that's a type of deterioration that I also felt when I was in prison, when I created the first uh, painting titled Deterioration. Let, let's stay on this, um, this topic of, uh, of uh, representing significant figures a bit and um, maybe move to the next slide okay. um, because you painted a number of political figures. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, why those choices, and maybe you can talk a bit about these next few paintings, why you chose these figures um, and how you chose to depict them and why. Okay. This is a very interesting piece right here. Where uh, I guess the people in this our audience know that I've been incarcerated from a wrongful conviction. And during that time, I studied law and kept researching, trying to figure out how do I get my life back? In the background of that research, I found Joe Biden's name continually pop up. He was working on criminal justice reform for decades now. In the background, even before he became vice president, he was working on it. And I thought that it was significant and powerful that uh, President Biden was actually trying to deliver the relief that a lot of inmates were seeking, including myself. And I woke up one day and said, he's going to be president. You know, the things that he's doing with his life that people don't see that's not coming out on the news. The news are not covering it. But when you read all these documents, he's actually in the background really writing some, some very powerful uh, reform um, petitions. So I woke up one day and said, he's going to be president. And everybody laughed at me. It was 2013 or 14. And I put that he's the he's the next man up but he's going to follow the same legacy because he's in the background feeding the information to obama and a lot of people don't know that you know and i say you know he his policy is going to make it to the top he's going to be president so i painted him and 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 still to give an honor to obama the man behind the man is the title of it he was the man behind obama but now he's going to be in front. He will be the next president and Obama will be supporting him silently from the back. That's the way I saw it in my mind. So I tried to take that and develop that into a piece of art. I ran into surprises on this because after I painted everything I wanted into the painting, everything was at one level that it's just like a flat painting. It became how do you how do you give it depth? How do you separate and push that other flag so far behind Obama, then Obama, then the blue flag, and then Biden? And trying to feel me to adjust those colors with glazes, like you paint it all in, you start putting thin washes over it until it's phase back. And it's, it's a process that takes drying. It has to dry before you can do the next step. So you have to wait a week and then come back to some more. So Yeah, especially because you're doing this all in oil. It's an audience, yeah. 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 I mean, I'm starting to think you had some crystal ball hidden somewhere because, <laughs> you know, a lot of these paintings you made over the years, years before things actually did happen. You know, well, I stay, I stay, in, Christine, I stay in prayer. I mean, even like, you know, all day, every day, I'm grateful for every day that I wake up because, you know, by being alive, spiritually alive, and physically alive, and you wake up, you wake up having opportunity. There's so many people don't, don't have opportunity mm -hmm. to make any changes in their life. You know, the people that even, the, you think about the ones in the hospital, and these are the type of images running through my mind constantly every day. People are living in, in turmoil, fear, um, health-wise, everything. I'm just so grateful for my health. 
uh, to have the opportunity to share what God is sending through me with the public mm -hmm. in the form of these artworks that's coming out of my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're yeah. wild. Yeah, that's something that we've talked about, that sometimes when people talk about or write about your work, there's a lot of emphasis that's put in, you know, the, the tears and the sort of sadness and interiority. But there's also so much about optimism and hope and projection that, that I find always in your work or in so many of the, the compositions and the imagery and the canvases that you have. Um, maybe we can move to the next slide, please. Let's talk about Hillary's tears. That's a, that's a good one. I have this, this painting here. When I look at it, you know, I did the best I could, you know, and I, I keep finding, I critique myself with every painting. I did the best I could with Hillary. Um, I think with this painting here, it's, it's an oil, 1824, all on stretch canvas. Um, they were every, okay. How, how do I say this? The election was starting up, and everybody's rallying. They putting, you know, they're talking. Uh, everybody has a political opinion. I don't. I don't have a political opinion about politics. It's just part of what it is. But in praying and creating this piece, I had to look into the future of everybody running: Sarah Palin, John Edwards, John McCain. Mm -hmm. uh, Obama as well. And my heart told me that Obama was going to win. This painting was created, started, took months to do the painting. It was like probably in 2007 when I started it. Um, trying to find how do you emotionally capture? So first of all, I, as an artist, I have to feel the end result to find the subject matter to start to build on. So I went through a lot of research looking at pictures of Hillary and different things that happened into her life. And I found this picture as a start and I started creating from that. You know, that, that picture with her hand, like looking into her future or into her past, it's hard to say. And here with the tears, it, it kind of puts it metaphorically in both ways still. Is she looking into her future? This is back before the election. Or is she now looking at it as her past? So trying to create that type of an image that leaves a person to wonder, where is her mind at right now? Is there any regrets for the what had happened? But it's just the truth of how I saw it. So at that time, Obama hadn't won. Uh -huh. and, but to find pictures of his family and convert it into a celebratory event that he won and, you know, put that signage in. This is uh, Hillary's Tears. And she's just one of a, a series of, of all the candidates that ran against Obama. I created uh, drawings and uh, paintings as many as I could get through. Oh, so you you did a whole series of the can the the various candidates, not just Hillary in this series. No, 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 no. We did. Yeah, we did John McCain, Obama, uh, uh, Sarah Palin. Uh, you have one in there with John McCain, uh, him and Bush, because Bush was his advisor. He was part of the Republican platform. And um, and I knew that I knew that wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a person? I know I'm supposed to be answering all the questions, but can I ask one? Sure. OK. So when you look at it, how do it make you feel? What do you think about this this specific piece? You know, I actually, I wasn't sure if you, you had painted this after or before she lost. This was before. Yeah. And that, now you're, you're saying that she painted it before and it makes me really wonder, like, if you have a, some secret <laughs> you know, crystal ball hidden somewhere in your pocket that you pull out. <laughs> or, you know, right. Uh, right. you know, and it's, it's also, you know, we celebrate Obama's victory. Mm -hmm. and his presidency, um, but also the sadness and not just, you know, at that moment for her, but again, 2016. Yeah. And, and that, of course, a much more tragic moment. So, you know, it is an emotional painting, I think. And, um, but I think it's also bittersweet because I think in the end, she and Obama were really allies in many ways, even yes. though opponents yes. and allies. So there's a... Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I, I agree. It's that's politics, though. I mm-hmm. mean, politics, you have to reach across the aisle. Mm-hmm. You can't be enemies, you know, in, in the political. You know, it's just trying to get the agenda of whatever you believe is the best for the uh, for society. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I can also imagine, I mean, or, you know, this is somewhat of a question, but you, when you are incarcerated and your ability to participate, you know, of course, you know, we've talked about this, how you are studying law, you're trying to understand aspects of the law in a wider landscape of the law, but also more specific to your, your, your situation being wrongfully incarcerated you know, what are the processes around clemency, being pardoned, you know, trying to raise money um, for your legal team and, you know, for your defense, so on and so forth. And you're coming across, you know, Biden's story and understanding his petitions and and policies that he's trying to to put into place and having a different kind of uh, understanding and history and, and connection with politicians and understanding what they're trying to do in a different way than people who are on the outside. Yeah. I'm not, I'm re- really not sure how to answer that, Christine. I mean, we, I mean, my life had me in there, you know, really looking at, it's really strange. This way, this way is going in my head right now. When I look back over my life, all the way from the 60s, like 62, 63, all the way up until the 90s. People have always voted at our house. So I would always hear political conversations with my mom and the different people that would come. I remember uh, Diane Feinstein, I met her several times when I was a kid, she came by the house uh, and she visited the different poll places. So, Studying the law and then the idea of how I thought it operate, then to come to see how it actually does operate and trying to figure a way out. I remember when at the time when I was working on these paintings, the political tears, uh, my deceased attorney, Karen Smith, she was a professor at Southwestern University of Law. She had an idea that we would try and help the campaign and help uh, the people by painting these pictures, you know, when Obama went in uh, pictures of Hillary for the women's group, the lawyers that, you know, this women group of lawyers. And that picture never made it out to my, you know, to my family for over a year after I sent it out of prison Mm -hmm. until I had to file a federal lawsuit to try to find the picture, you know, and eventually did. Now the ones of uh, John McCain made it, but Hillary and Obama, they just came up missing, you know, and, then when Obama got elected, the, the one of um, Michelle Obama called first lady, it got destroyed. They stabbed a hole in it, broke all of my tools, put them in the mm-hmm. trash can in front of my artwork. So it just, you know, looking at this picture takes me back in time to the time when I was actually in prison, you know, painting and all the different stuff that happened around politics and how people really, um, the politics really move their life. It moves the needle, you know, one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, a nice segue to the next slide, because this is, I mean, speaking of prophetic and profound. The next slide. Uh, no, it's, we should be on the emancipation. Part. There we go. Mm. Now, um, I'd love for you to tell the, the long version of the story. <laughs> long version. Okay, here's the long version. The Emancipation Proclamation. This is the last painting that I painted while in federal custody. I think we started on this, the composition of this picture in 2013 when we were applying for clemency. So I put my clemency petition in and I, I wrote letters to all the staff, all of Obama staff through email. We had this Coralink thing in the prison that allowed you to do emails. And I requested from everybody that's in this picture as well as a lot of people that's not uh, I had this idea. I went to the law library one day and just, you know, just felt like getting a book. Somebody told me to go, go to the, the window and I asked the guy for a book and I didn't have any idea what he was going to hand me. And he handed me a book. When I opened it up, it opened to that picture of Lincoln, as you can see up in the right hand corner, left hand corner. 
it was an old picture. Um, France, Francine Blackwell, Bachwell. The yeah, Francis Bicknell Carpenter painting from yeah. 1864 of uh, Abraham Lincoln and his cabinet members reading the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah, they was going over, to, you know, I read the little story and I realized that it had nothing changed. So here, here's the long story. I, I, I saw the picture and realized that nothing had changed. And I looked at it and I saw myself there inside of this picture and decided to take it and try to hold all the people in the same kind of position. But it was just so many people that I looked at that had the keys to the door to give me my freedom back. It was coming through Obama, but it's also it was the pardon attorney, uh, his legal counsel. So I wrote them all emails and say, look, I have an idea for a piece of artwork. I would like to include you in it. Uh, will you please send me a picture? Some of them sent pictures of me. And they were, the thing is, they would only send their heads. You know, I know early on you asked about what surprises do you have in creating this piece. This Pacific painting, I only had faces of people. I had no bodies. So I had to take the faces and I asked them, I sent them a picture of it and asked them to circle and dot where they wanted to be in the painting. And some of them made their selection. Some people sent back emails and said, I don't want to be in no prison art. And I'm fine. Some people never responded. And I sent as many as three emails to them. And then the final email to the ones that didn't send pictures in, because I was ready to get started. I could only build it as the images came in. And I said, well, if you don't respond to this, I'm going to take that as a yes. And I'll use something off the public platform. Well, through the grace of God having Mr. Brown with the silver hair standing up under Abraham Lincoln, he was a supervisor of education who allowed me a space in the education department to work as well as work in the hobby shop. If the prison go on lockdown while everybody else was in their cells, I could still go to work in education and teach my classes. And so he had to be in the picture. Um, and he actually gave me a picture of him. You know, we took a picture of him and I included him into that painting. Uh, the rest of them, I had to go through Bold Magazine to find clothes. Uh, I had to find the hand, that gesture that I needed for Obama. I had to go through a lot of images of Obama speaking and talking just to get his hand. I needed that one hand. I, I needed Lincoln has his hand on the chair. I couldn't find that. But I did find one that Obama had his other hand on his leg. So I cut that out. And I just kind of like took all this about 40 pictures to create this one painting. And then we come to the Last Supper. A lot of people ask about the Last Supper. Oh, you put the Last Supper in. Well, the Last Supper is full of the rest of the, the guards at the prison. That's not, you know, that's uh, Mr. Russell in the middle. He's the, he don't have hair like that. And he didn't want to give me a picture. He said, no, uh -uh, I'm not on. I don't know. Don't put me in there. But he helped me do the composition. He was assigned to me to do the research to get the images of everybody else in there off the internet. And so I decided to slide him in. So I gave him long hair. He got a big bald spot in the top. So I put the hair on him and he's there with me while I'm creating this artwork, but don't know that that's him right there because he can't imagine himself with hair, right? And so <laughs> we, we pull that off. Um, my daughter, Erica, you know, we had to put her in. Well, she was my greatest advocate. You know, she ran back and forth to that prison for, for years, her and my daughter, Bayon. And um, but she did a lot of the contacting the people. She provided the place for me to stay coming home. I wanted to make sure that I acknowledge her efforts in her life by putting her in, into this painting. And another thing that a lot of people don't know is that up under the desk is a painting that I painted before. That painting up under the desk is an actual painting that's uh, 24 by 36 when I was in the Supreme Court for four years waiting to be heard that can an innocent person get bail if the evidence is clear that he, he has innocence without going through the long procedure. And it looked like they were gonna answer and something happened in the nation that caused them to finally put it over to the side. But I repainted that painting into the painting because that was another attempt that I went to the political system to try to uh, get relief. And finally, I end up to the final thing is that there was nothing else left for me to do. I have touched every uh, system 
inside of the federal system and they say, you only have one thing left before you die. And that's to ask the president of the United States. And you can do that, but good luck. And so while we had our petition there, I created this Emancipation Proclamation. And I want to make sure that because I was titling it, titling it the same as the other emancipation, that's why I included Lincoln in there to make sure that plagiarism, it is not, I'm not trying to plagiarize and paint that painting, but I want to let people know that from 1863 to right now, nothing has really changed for us, for the people of color, we still suffer. And at the time, I didn't even know when I painted this painting that I was born on a plantation. I didn't find that out until after uh, I got out because they had passed a law that said that if you didn't have a birth certificate, that you'd have to go to INS. And I didn't want to go to INS. My family found my birth certificate, birth certificate in Louisiana and sent it to the prison and the warden brought it to me and said, my God, you know, and all the pictures have this captivity in them. You know, I'm, I'm here sitting here in shackles and chains with my hand withdrawn why he tried to explain, they want remorse. And I cannot sign a letter of remorse to a crime I did commit. So I'm looking at the paper and listening to him and Loretta Lynch is like, you're not gonna take the deal? No, I can't take the deal, I died first. And that was the letter that I put together and gave to them. And uh, eventually though, about three weeks, my lawyer, uh, Mr. Feldman, Mr. Feldman standing by, uh, James Feldman out of Florida, standing by my daughter, he took a picture of the painting to DC and he showed it around and they thought it was a photograph. And that's how they really started, according to his words, they started investigating my case. And within three weeks, they told me to go home. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for every day of it now, you know? And I think that as an artist, uh, my job and my responsibility is to capture history and share history as it happened as it's happening right now with us it don't have to be that grandiose significant famous person because each person who spiritually alive that's alive is a part of history and let's give them a voice let's give them a face you know let's show that they are important too and i i thank god that he blessed me with a hand to do that Remarkable painting, remarkable story. Thank you. Yeah. We had not question number three was like had parts A, B, C, D, E. Let's okay. move on to question number four. Okay, number four. Um, next slide, please. What does the inclusion of your work, um, Shattered Dreams, um, in Black American Portraits, um, an exhibition of over 200 years of African American portrait? Um, perhaps change the way you look at this piece? Do you see your work in conversation with any of the other artists or works in the exhibition? Yes, I do. Listen, first of all, I'm grateful to Lagman, Christine, you, the team, uh, to Michael, to everybody who uh, allowed me to have that platform to, to share with the world. I see now in relationship to all the other paintings that I too have a place in history that the portion of my life that was taken away from me only became a bridge to bring me into a better place in life. Um, I think that this painting will be in conversation be in the future against a lot of other works. It's gonna be in conversation about how uh, artists, when I, I don't know a lot about art, but when I look at and read some of the books, you know, they talk about this artist was able to capture light and this artist, this artist here was able to, 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 to illuminate fire and so forth on. I think that in conversation that Shattered Dreams and some of the other works is that an artist was able to come in a time and do some of the things that had already been done to bring that energy of light forward but more so than anything, I think is that we have an artist and God has blessed me with a hand to capture human emotion and make a person that's not even connected to the painting, look at it and feel and to drift inside to, for that spirit to connect with a painting as if it was a living thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a little bit rarer than in the work you see. You see, I see a lot of work is pretty, but a lot of it don't really, 
It's just, it's good workmanship. Sometimes I think it's too perfect, but I think finding the imperfection in people helps to deliver the spirit that's inside of them mm -hmm. to where people can feel that person. I'm looking at this pain now and it feels like Kobe talking to me like, wash, wash, you know, because mm -hmm. it's that stare in one eye and a gaze in another. You know, when you have, you're doing one thing, but your mind is somewhere else. A lot of time when I'm painting, that's what happens with me. I'm in there painting the picture and my eyes and hands are working together, but my spirit be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, being able to be in conversation amongst some of the great artists that I think a lot greater artists than I am, you know, that they respect, they have a, a sense of respect. I appreciate it. Thank you. Especially the one that uh, above, I'm looking in, in your in your view. Oh yeah, I'm gonna say the the one behind this above me. Yeah, I met Lita her. Rose. I, met, I met her, and we had conversation because she do some things with color and water that I have. I've always I just don't quite understand it. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a workshop studio together and share some knowledge. You know. Yeah. He's impressed. You're gonna, have, you're gonna have a small paintbrush contest. <laughs> no, not a contest. I don't like I'm <laughs> joking. Yeah, no, because if you compete, then somebody's going to feel bad. No, no, yeah. I'm just saying because the, both of you, of all the artists in the show, I've never seen the level of, you know, detail. I mean, with her, it's in these little ripples and bubbles yeah. in, the, in the water. And in, in yours, it's, it's the, the, the faces, you know, like you said, it's the tip of your, you know, pinky fingernail in, in those yeah. little faces there. And, you know, in, in, in her work, um, you know, the, the, the hopefulness and the optimism, and, and we're going to get to a couple more slides that, that speak to this, but in the way that she um, has depicts black bodies in, in water mm -hmm. and, and sort of this type of imagery, whereas I think in, in, you know, when people, sometimes when people imagine black bodies in water, it's more connected to middle passage, transatlantic slave trade, or yeah. Jim Crow laws and pools and so on and so forth. But in her case, she's finding the, the joy and leisure, yes. and levitation and buoyancy and spirituality, yes. baptisms, you know, water as this, right. this, this other type of space. And of course, there are lots of images like that, but let's put those forward, you know? Yeah. And so I think having your your works together i mean literally one stacked on top of an, another there's a there's a real vibration there and also this kind of you know the, the realism yeah you know yeah and, she's good yeah. she is really good i, I love her work okay. i looked at a lot of her work i just love it mm -hmm. i just can't wait we was together in miami at art basil and uh we just gotta we gotta hook up so maybe when i finish this thing i'm working on now maybe we get a chance to i can go visit some artists that sounds great. And That's she's, good. She's just in Inglewood here, so. You got me smiling inside now. <laughs> yeah. Me too, me, me too. Um, all right, so we have one more question, then I welcome um, people in the audience to please type in any questions or thoughts into um, the chat, and I'm happy to, um, to take any of those. Um, so the final one is, uh, I want to ask you about um, the function of portraits today. Um, and... Thank you for pulling up this this slide because this is quite a different one um, from the portraits that that we've seen. Um, not not a famous face, um, but one that you sourced from an, an unknown figure that you sourced from, I believe, a a magazine. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about this this painting, this image. This picture is titled "The Next Generation," and I saw this picture in the National Geographic years ago. And I held on to it because it just, it connected with me. And I felt sad for those kids, you know, that all out there and, and the look of them, they were tired, they were muddy and so forth on in the fields, picking gourds. They were picking gourds and some other type of vegetables out in the open field. And the photographer took the picture. This one girl stood up amongst all the rest of the children and I spotted her, you know? looking directly at the thing that the man had in his hand, which I know was a camera. And I decided to paint it. And I wanted to do something different because, you know, as I say, she's standing in the middle of a field. So I had to create some kind of background because I didn't want to paint her in the middle of a field. 
I wonder, you know, what what would she be doing if she didn't have to pick fruit? And then the, the idea came, well, what if she had the opportunity to play like kids her age, eight or nine years old, playing tennis or basketball or baseball or softball as our children do? But she's in a country where she, the child labor is producing the produce for the economy. Mm. And I'm like, wow. I thought about how grateful I was that I didn't have to do that. And still not knowing at the time that I was born on a plantation. And I do remember times that we picked fruit. Our family used to stand on the corner in, in the 60s and sell oranges and watermelons and different fruits that we can go and pick out of uh, Bakersfield. So I created this piece, created a background. I want to try my hand on cracked dry wood uh, and creating soft shadows and so forth on. And while creating it, one of the inmates came and said, man, you know, you should put a, a, a Nike sign in and send this to Nike and maybe they could support you with the legal fight. And we did. I added it to it. Um, and we never did get it to Nike. I thought that this really would be a good opportunity for them to uh, maybe do some diversity and help, you know, advance the sport and bring new talent into the sport, as well as to try to help pay some of the legal expenses that was constantly running. But yeah, this is next generation. It's a young girl that's painted in acrylic on a canvas board. And it took a lot of layers of paint, but you can see the amount of detail in it. That amount of detail that you see that the nails got rust spots on them. And that was time that I slowed my mind down and was able to be thinking about my case and my family and, and what my journey was doing. So it became this picture was a really, a real, I, as I look at it now, I was meditating. I was meditating. I was creating difficulty for myself in the form of painting, but never giving up that I would complete all the way through the picture, every little square inch, some type of detail, some type of crack that never existed before, um, a, a lip of wood, a piece of rot. I think I painted a couple of ants in this picture too, like crawling around, tiny little bitty ants somewhere in there. Um, yeah, that's next generation. And I think the question was, uh, was the function of the portraits today? The, the, the function of, to me, this is my perspective. I'm not saying this is universal, but I think that the function of portraits today is to give acknowledgement to the real structure of society. Our society is not just kings and presidents and so forth, all it's people. And I think that all these people need to have a voice and have a place uh, in history to be acknowledged because you don't have nothing on the top without the support of what's on the bottom, if you want to look at it like that. And so these people that's down there picking the food, their life is just as important as the person who's up top eating it. And I was hoping that with this specific picture, that in time, that uh, facial recognition was coming out during that time and it was supposed to overcome and everything like how it is now. I'm looking at the computer, this thing don't open up unless I look at it. So hopefully that this face is accurate enough that facial recognition can find that child mm -hmm. and that we can gift that child some type of monetary or uh, even just the, for her, wherever she's at in the world to know that you've been painted. You know, how many people go through their life and they don't have a portion of themselves? For, for her to know that, that might add some, some self-esteem to her life or condition. It may bring her a little bit of fame and we will surely pray that it could bring us some fortune because this shirt actually comes out on t-shirts uh, and mugs and different stuff up under uh, the Art by Wash brand and Washwear brand, the clothesline. And so them, them proceeds could be redirected to her. Mm -hmm. you know, and it could help her life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that the function of, of portraiture today is to give a voice to the unspoken voice, mm -hmm. that people who never would ever been heard of in life, that we as artists, we have an opportunity to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. you know, we are, uh, art is a way of communicating and a way of capturing history that can't be re retyped and reworded. Right. Once we do it, it's not like you can write a story and you say, oh, well, I don't really like the way it sounds. Let's kind of change the word here and we're going to make it move here. You can't, once the painting is painted, that's history as it was. And 
that's what our function is to capture history in, in the form of portraits because we don't paint these pictures for dogs and cats. They don't have appreciation for art. We paint pictures so other people can see them. And so portraits of the day is to bring, to bring about that conscience of thinking about other things other than yourself and other people. Yes. So, thank you. Uh, we have a few comments here, and I want to read you the comments, even some of them that are not questions, but just because they are quite moving. Marion okay. Williams says, Mr. Wash, your paintings are amazing. The emotions, passions, and your interpretations of each subject is profound. Wow, I absolutely must see these pictures in person. I'm so thrilled I get to meet you in the Zoom. Marion, please do come see the show. It's open through April 17th. Teresa Shellcroft writes, wonderful discussion. I'm an art educator, art history instructor of African-American, African and Western art. I'm also an artist. I would like to know how to get in touch with Mr. Wash for further discussion on many levels of art production. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Wash is art by wash. Is that's your URL, yeah, your website, yeah, artbywash.com. Yeah, yeah, so please do reach out to, to Mr. Wash, um, an anonymous attendee. Uh, asked Mr. Wash, how do you bring hope and joy in images, tears especially that could feel so sad and hopeless? It's like the tears are cleansing as well as reflections of sadness. Wow, that is great. That is, that's good. It is because a lot of times, it's not that I'd be trying to make sadness. It is a cleansing. It is a cleansing. It's a relief. Like when you cry, when I cried, I, I, I cried. I mean, that's how the very first teardrop started one day. I heard Tim McGraw's song. I don't know why they say grown men don't cry. And I start crying like a baby in the art room, but I couldn't let nobody hear. Cause if they heard it's gonna turn into a fight. I knew it. So I hid behind my canvas. But when I went back to my cell, I drew a sketch of myself crying. And then I turned around and painted that picture. And that was the very first teardrop. And when the people saw it, when the officers and the warden, everybody saw it, it, it was emotionally catching everybody because nobody could ever imagine I would be in there crying, mm. right? That's how I walked the yard. So that opened that door, it created a bridge that the vulnerability that they were suffering with, they would come and have these sessions with me one-on-one -on -one and tell me their stories and I would paint those stories. I would paint with that, the love that they had inside, not the sadness, but the love that they had the missing the kids, missing the family, missing their mom. I would paint the mom in the tears and let the mom know that they are crying. Why do you think they're a criminal that they so hard? They, they crying, but they're crying for you because they love you. And that's what the teardrop is started. And um, like I said, the first one was me uh, the, going through the process of losing my wife. And she was like, I can't do this anymore. I need to go on. Okay, and I'll say, go, you know, and but I was sad inside. But I, I didn't cry then. But when I heard Tim McGraw's song, it just brought me to tears and I didn't know what to do. And I was, I just did, I didn't want it to turn to something really ugly. And so mm -hmm. I drew it out and I painted all that emotion into the painting. And mm -hmm. people felt it and came and asked me to create images of them. And it just never, it haven't stopped yet. I just got through doing a, a teardrop of Drake, <laughs> another one of Kobe, um, and just keep going. Yeah. It's making me also think about the connection of the water with Kalita's painting. Mm -hmm. They both wet. Another water way. stay fluid. Yeah. yeah. And another. That, hey, who is that that asked the question? She was anonymous, anonymous attendee. Anonymous hey, attendee. anonymous attendee. Thumbs up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one last question. What tools did you utilize to express yourself while incarcerated? Were there any other ideas you could not render during this time due to your circumstances that were realized once out. How did your perspective change? Now, that, that started out as a single course and it turned into a compound course and then it was a compounded compound course. So <laughs> the, tools, the tools that I utilized in prison were very limited, very limited. Um, give you an example. Those that know how to paint, you know, we use a palette knife in order to mix paint to get it, you know, mix the colors together. Sure. We couldn't have a palette knife in prison because the system would not allow a knife to be ordered in prison. It just won't go through because it's a knife, it's a weapon. And it's like, it's a palette knife. So I have to in turn take a spatula, a rubber spatula, and I have it now. 
there's my spatula. I had to actually take, this was a flat spatula. And I had to take this that we use in the bakery to whip up butter and different stuff and grind it down and set it on fire and bend it and turn it into the shape of a spatula to mix my paint. I turned it in to ask, could it be approved too? They sent it back to me and told me that the handle was too hard and that you probably could you know, kill somebody with it. So I had to take a demo and grind this middle piece out to make it flexible. And they finally approved it. This was back in 2007. And I've been using this ever since. So you actually use that actual tool that, yeah. that you brought with you? Yeah. Yeah, this was a big thing about this long. It's about about big as this paintbrush. It was a big flat spatula, you know, about 12 or 14 inches. You used to whip up butter and cream or whatever. And I grind it down and, and made that piece of plastic. And it's a rubberized plastic into this spatula. That was one of the things that was that really came across that you're trying to learn something and learn how to do, it, but you can't have the proper tools to do it with. Then we couldn't have any uh, paint that had any type of anything toxic in it because we can only get school grade. So all the works that you see that was created in prison was painted with some of the lowest medium grade paints. Uh, we couldn't use uh, linseed oil because it's flammable. So you couldn't have anything flammable. And it became a back and forth problem. And then you couldn't paint. Um, the Zimmermobile stopped anything like magazines or the human form, the nudity or whatever, you couldn't paint it. Like the painting behind me, I couldn't have painted that in prison. I created the first one, but I had to flatten the chest out and not have an areola or a nipple on it, uh, male or female, because it, it wasn't allowed. So I had to wait till I come home to really paint like I want to paint, or what, to paint the full message out. So I had to find other ways. Uh, it's very restricted in there. I thank God. That I was grateful again that because I was the institutional artist and I did do a lot of community service works. I donated murals, paintings, artwork for the funerals of the officers that died and so forth on that I did get the opportunity to actually paint with oils at that prison. First prison mm -hmm. started out, oils was okay. The other prison said no, no oils at that level going down, level up, you could have those things because they weren't there's so many people getting killed with knives, they don't care about no paint. Coming down, you couldn't have anything glass. You couldn't have anything that's toxic. Uh, too many inmates had access to police food. They didn't want you to put nothing in the food or somebody steal it out your locker and poison the police. So it's all kind of stuff like that. Very restrictive environment to work in. And so you had, instead of linseed oil, turpentine, all these materials, these chemicals that one would use for oil paint, do you just find substitute alternative Liquids yeah. and dilute. well, we, we listen. I've try, tried everything. I've tried baby oil, everything. the baby oil. We tried the cooking all out the kitchen. Uh, we just you have to try and make stuff to make it work. You can't complain about what you don't have. You have to look at what you do have and just make the best of. You know. Um, but then what I did, I went a step further, and as the art instructor, I actually petitioned. You know, at one of the prisons we couldn't have uh, green. We couldn't have no green paint. In one prison, they, we couldn't have red or blue there was, because of the, the, the games, you know, the Crips and the Bloods was not, nothing, no blue paint, no blue pencils, no red pencils, no blue, you know. So how do you paint this? You only have three primary colors, mm -hmm. yellow, red, and blue. That's your primaries. And so how you want me to teach a class, but I can't have the colors to teach it with? Mm -hmm. I get to the next prison, we get over that point. And the whole thing was they didn't want them to be painting their tennis shoes and, you know, paint stuff, you know, whatever. And so I had to really talk to the population and say, look, man, I'm trying to bring something to the table to help y'all, but y'all got to help me help yourself. You know, you, uh, you're a gang member. OK, do your thing, but don't let that become part of my class. Right. Yeah. And so the institution allowed us to, to get the colors in, to get the class started. The class was a success. Next person I get to, they say, well, you can't have no green because an uh, inmate with the last name of green killed one of our officers. And now every time they get green, they want to write green all over the walls on their bed and, and mock the police. And it, it dawned on me that when I got arrested, shortly after I got arrested and was sent to the federal detention center while I was going to court, they killed the officer. 
And they came to me and asked me to create his funeral uh, arrangements. And I did. But that was, now here goes 15 years later, I'm at the prison where he got killed, Scott Williams. And I tell him, so wait a minute, you're going to tell me I can't use green as an artist, but you want an art program. Do you know that I'm the inmate who created the artwork for the funeral for, for this prison, for his family, for his wife? I did four pieces of art before I was ever even convicted. I'm still going to trial. And I created the art for that. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing pencil work. I did it all with pencil and markers. And that's how I got my first supplies. It's the, the warden of uh, MDCLA allowed me to keep the supplies I used to build that. And that kind of helped start the career as well. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. What the, the, so listen, the moral to the story is this. Give from your heart. Give unconditionally. And you receive your bounty. You know, me being arrested and saying I refuse to do anything for a police officer. And I, I've never been charged with I mean, I've never been. The crime that you charged me for is not my crime. So I didn't feel like that I'm a convict. If a person died and they, the family needs a relief from that grief. And I think that I can do it better than anybody else. Yeah, I do it. And I did it. Not looking for anything in return. Yeah. But in return, they gave me tools to work with. Yeah. So. Well, on that, thank you for your <clears throat> generosity, your vision, mm -hmm. your tenacity, oh. your creativity, your endurance, and your joy. Um, I look forward to many years of your art ahead of you and look forward to what you're going to produce in Palm Springs. And for everyone out there, if you haven't seen the show, please come see the show and Mr. Wash's work. If you have seen it, please come back. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Can I, can I, oh, can yeah, I please. Okay, so look, I need, they're telling me, I don't know a lot about social media and I don't really go in and out of there every day, but they tell me I need to get to 10,000 followers, right? And I, so Mr. Wash, the artist on Instagram, that's me. Uh, I haven't done a post probably in a couple of months, um, but yeah, please follow me on that. Uh, come out to see the show at LACMA for sure. Great show. I mean, the artwork in there is just is superb. And because a lot of the type of styles of work that I do, uh, people haven't seen like the one behind me, uh, a whole collection of surrealism stuff that's like weird stuff out of your brain uh, will be on display here in, in Palm Springs in April. So come out. We're getting a lot of messages in the chat now. People saying, I'm following you, just followed you, thumbs up. Clapping emojis. So <laughs> thank, thank you, you so know, much. Yeah, I don't know why my numbers don't keep moving because I get people following me all the time, but then the numbers are staying right there for like months. But I, somebody said I need to do something, but I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do on the phone. So I'm gonna keep telling people. Everybody tell your friends. Yeah, right. Yeah, everybody tell your friends. Okay. Yeah, and, and go visit the website. We should have that thing completely yeah. functional. Art by wash. Art by yeah. wash. Okay, anything else? Anybody got anything else? I hate to leave. I feel good talking. This feels this I know, is better, I know, this is better than pain. Oh, no, someone that, just said you have 9,585 followers. Almost there. Okay. okay. Tell your friends, tell your friends' friends, tell your friends' friends' families, <laughs> neighbors, yeah. grandmas. Okay, let's see if we can't move that number. I'm going to write it down and see how many people follow me and how many times, how, how much it go up. You got to start you. a raffle, R win a painting. <laughs> oh, we're going to listen. We do have follow the art by watch.com because we're going to have some, some raffles like this shirt I have on now. It might not be this Look one. At that. But Look definitely at that. Some, some of the works that I'm creating right now for this Palm Swing show, we are, we are going to do a raffle or uh, some type giveaway to help people that may not can afford the work. So, yes, yeah, I'm always trying to figure out a way to give back. And thank all of you for sharing your time with me today because time is your most valuable asset. And you have to be careful how you spend it and who you spend it with. So I'm grateful that you spent some time with me. Thank you so much, Fulton. Okay.